The Bible says, I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We want to thank God for the privilege of being in the house of the Lord. It was about three years ago when I was in Zimbabwe for my vacation, and I had a privilege to sit down for a lunch with one of my spiritual mentors. Uh, his name is uh, Evangelist Alfred Nyagunada. Great guy, evangelist. So we were speaking during this lunch. Uh, he was trying to mentor me how to make a sermon, how to make an appeal. How can we finish the work so that Jesus Christ can come very soon? And I still remember that he gave me an illustration that I will never forget. He said, you see, Patson, in a football match, there are 90 minutes in a football match. After the 90 minutes, the referee will give you the extra five minutes. Now, during the extra five minutes, this is the time it's either do and die. In the extra five minutes, it is a time where the, all the players, they have to give their best. In the last five minutes, he said, Patson, you have to do whatever you can do so that the team can be able to win the match. You see, friends, in our spiritual journey, if you read Matthew chapter 24, I would like to believe that uh, we are no longer in the we are no longer in the in the 90 minutes, but we are living in the last five minutes. Jesus is coming very soon. He said, Pat Son, we are living in the last five minutes. Every time you get an opportunity to preach the word of God, preach like someone who's living in the last five minutes. And brothers and sisters, every time you get an opportunity to either give a special item, sing like someone who's living in the last five minutes. If you have been given a, a, a task to pray or do whatever to do in this pulpit, always know that we are living in the last five minutes. Today, church, allow me to preach like someone who is living in the last five minutes. It was November 16. There was a movie that came out called The Haxel Ridge by Desmond Dawes. Can I see how many of you have watched that move at the, the Haxoris by Desmond Dawes? All right, so we're on the same page. Desmond Dawes was born in the year of 1919. Nin yeah, 1919. Desmond Dawes, he was a Seventh-day Adventist. Desmond Dawes, he believed in the Ten Commandments. Desmond Dawes believed in the Sabbath. Desmond Dawes believed that those should not kill. But in the year of 1942, Desmond Dawes, he was told uh, he went on a war. As Desmond Dawes, he went on a war. There are two things here. He told the captain... He told, he, he, he told the captain that, listen, I am a seven-day Adventist. I keep the Sabbath. Listen, I'm a seven-day Adventist. I cannot carry a gun because this is against my God. During the war, can you imagine, instead of killing people, Desmond Dawes, he was saving the life of people. Every time Desmond Dawes would save a life, he would say, dear Jesus, just give me one more. At the end of the war, Desmond Dawes, he was able to save the life of 70 people. When it was Sabbath, when people would go for training, when people would go to, to the war, Desmond Dawes would stay in his room and obey the Sabbath. Desmond Dawes, he was a good soldier. And as we're looking for the second soon coming of Jesus, I believe that Jesus is looking for a good soldiers that are going to be faithful until Jesus Christ comes. In the next 30 minutes or 40 minutes, friends, I'm going to preach about something that I struggle with. Living in Dubai, this is something that most of us, we struggle with. But because Jesus Christ is coming very soon, we need to preach about it. And let me just make it clear, I'm not preaching this one because I'm perfect. I am not perfect, but as I was making this sermon, this sermon was actually for me. And sometimes it is a burden as a preacher to make a sermon that has something to do with you. 
But I want to thank God because there is hope in Jesus. I want to thank God because there is victory in Jesus. You see, friends, as we're living in the last days, there are three things that the devil hates so much and is going to destroy in the last days. As a matter of fact, there are three holy things that they say that the devil hates so much and he's going to do whatever it takes to destroy these things. We are in a great controversy. Today, friends, we're going to look at the Sabbath. What is the Sabbath? Is it all about? Today, friends, we're going to look at the marriage. What does the Bible say about marriage? Today, friends, we're going to look at the tithe and offering. What does the Bible say about the tithe and offering? Actually, this is a series of sermon. I need about three Sabbaths to preach all this series, but I'm going to try my best to condense it in a short time. Let us pray, shall we? Father God, we come to you at this moment of time. May your name be lifted up. Today, Lord, we want to learn about the Sabbath. We want to learn about the marriages. We want to learn about the tithes and offering. Lord, my prayer is that may we not only the hearers of the word, but help us to be the doers of the word. In Jesus' name, I pray and I believe. Amen. Allow me to start my sermon by telling you the good news that Jesus Christ is coming again. We don't know when, but one thing we know for sure is that Jesus is coming again. But however, while we are waiting for the second soon coming of Jesus, please know that we are in a great controversy. We are in a war which is either good or bad. You see, friends, as we are waiting for the second soon coming of Jesus, uh, it's the question that comes is that which side are you standing on? Are you standing on the Lord's side or are you standing on the devil's side? You see, friends, as we're waiting for the second soon coming of Jesus, we cannot be a lukewarm Christian. You cannot be a Laodicean Christian. There are either two words. It's either you are hot or it's either you are cold. You see, friends, as we're waiting for the second soon coming of Jesus, you cannot be a part-time Christian, but you have to be a Christian each and every day. As we are waiting for for the second soon coming of Jesus. You cannot be a seventh-day Adventist on a Sabbath alone, and then during the week you are something else. But you need to be a seventh-day Adventist each and every day. I've had so many people that say, you know, uh, we are sinners. We cannot live a holy life as long as we're here. On yes, yes, I do agree that. But as I was looking at the Bible, there are some verses that can actually tell us that, yes, it is impossible to live a holy life. We can live a holy life. Go with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. The Bible says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You see, friends, we can't be able to live a holy life because the Bible has told that just as he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. It is written, be holy in everything that you do. I think in the land of Dubai, God is looking uh, for those people uh, that are going to be holy. The Bible says again in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says that, let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I think when we start to have at the mind of Jesus Christ, we can be able to live a holy life. In other words, it means that when we look at other people, we don't judge them, but we see them as candidates of heaven. Now we have to look at the two verses that can give us a clear picture that it is actually uh, possible to keep the Sabbath. It is actually possible uh, to, to, to have some holy marriages. It is possible to return our thoughts and offering. Now let's look at the Sabbath. There's an illustration that I want to give. You see, a car cannot move without a fuel. If you want to travel from point A to point B, you need to make sure that you have a fuel in your car. If you don't have any fuel, it is impossible for you to travel. You see, friends, a Sabbath, when we come to church, we are coming to refill ourselves. 
When we come to church, we are coming to refill ourselves so that we can be able to travel the next six days. We come to church, we refill ourselves spiritually, we refill ourselves physically, we refill ourselves mentally. This is the importance of the Sabbath. Now, it is very important that we see the Sabbath actually started in the creation. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, the Bible says that, First, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their varies. By the seventh day, God rested the work which he has been doing. So on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of the creation he has done. So there are three things that we can learn here. The first thing that we learn, we see that God, he rested on the Sabbath. If God was able to rest on the Sabbath, how much more you and I, we need to rest on the Sabbath. The other thing that we learn here is that God, he blessed the Sabbath. And then the third thing that we learn here is that God, he made it holy. And by the fact that we're living in the last five, in the last days, we are in a, we're in a great controversy. The devil knows that the Sabbath is holy and he's trying to do whatever it takes to destroy the Sabbath. First, uh, the book of John chapter 14, verse 15, the Bible says that if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, friends, we don't, keep, we don't keep the commandment because we need something from God, but we keep the commandment because we love God. You see, friend, we don't keep the Sabbath because we need anything from God, but because we are in a relationship with Christ. If we're in a relationship with Christ, it is a joy to keep the Sabbath day holy. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, the Bible says that, in fact, this is the love of God to keep his commandment. And his commandments, they are not a burden. Keeping the Sabbath is not a burden. We get excited that, praise God, because the Sabbath is coming. Why? Because it is the day whereby we can have a relationship with Christ. We can have a fellowship with Christ. You see, friends, we don't keep the Sabbath because we need a favor from God. But no, it's not a burden if you have that relationship with Christ. If you have that the mindset of Christ, we can be able to keep the Sabbath day holy. So the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you go to these commandments, they are divided into two categories. The first four commandments, that teaches us how to love God. And the last six commandments, that teaches us how to love our fellow men. Now go with me to this commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. The Bible says... Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughters, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor the cattle, nor the strangers within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, there are few things that here we're going to learn on this commandment. If you read the commandments, they all start with the word, you shall, you shall, you shall, you shall. But if you come to the fourth commandment, this is the only commandment that starts with the word, remember. Why did God say remember? I would like to believe that because he knew that in the last days, people are going to forget about the Sabbath. You see, friend, this commandment, it connects God and the human being. We see God in the, in the, we see God in the fourth commandment, and we see humans in the fourth commandment. That is the relationship. And the Bible says that six days you shall labor and do all your work. It becomes a challenge if you don't do anything in six days, and then on the Sabbath you want to rest. But the Bible says that six days, you shall labor. In other words, brothers and sisters, we need to work. We need to keep ourselves busy because the Bible says six days you shall labor and do all your work. And the other thing that I learned, the Bible says that, and your cattle. Now, what is your cattle? Anything that has to do with your business must stop. I don't know what it is that has to do with the business, but when it comes to the Sabbath, the Bible says that it should stop. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I've had an opportunity to be in, ch to be in this church for so many times. And uh, I've had so many testimonies from people 
that they were willing to stand up for Jesus. You see, friends, I've met so many people that have told me, Patson, I have decided to follow Jesus. They were willing to resign from their jobs and keep the Sabbath day holy. I have met some people in this church. They said, Patson, because of this Sabbath, this thing is holy. I have told my boss to deduct my salary for the sake of the Sabbath. I have met some people in this church that have told me, Patson, I was supposed to be promoted to be a manager, to be a team leader. But because of the Sabbath, I didn't get that promotion. And it is well. The cost of following Jesus. The Bible says that in the last days, friends, we need to keep the Sabbath day. And we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to keep the Sabbath day holy. Man, every, every time I go for an interview, job interview, I take it as an opportunity to preach about the Sabbath. You know, go for an interview. Tell us what is your name, how many years of working experience, how much is your salary and expectation. And then at the end, they'll be like, do you want to ask anything from our organization? And I'll be like, yes, please. This is a beautiful organization, but I just have one challenge. Just one challenge. Please tell us. I cannot work on the Sabbath. And some of them, they don't know what is the Sabbath. And that becomes an opportunity to preach about the Sabbath. You see, friends, when we go for our job interviews and we don't talk about the Sabbath, you just keep quiet. And then when you start working, don't expect to get a Saturday off. Why? Because on the very beginning, you didn't stand up for your faith. And God is looking for those people that are going to stand up though the heavens might fall. Friends, we cannot compromise. I remember again another story. I had a very, very busy week. So I came to church on a Sabbath. And my car was very dirty. Lord have mercy. So I parked my car in, in, in this common parking. As I parked my car, this guy came to me and he said, Sir, can I please wash your car? And I look at my car. The car is really dirty. And he's like, it's only 15 dirhams to wash the car. And it's Sabbath. And the verse came to me. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son, nor your daughters, nor the aliens within that gate. So it becomes a problem if I'm going to ask this guy to wash my car. And I'm like, my brother, listen, my car is dead. I know. But I'm so sorry. And there was no like, proper English. I'm like, listen, it's haram for you to wash my car on the Sabbath. And then that was an opportunity to preach about the Sabbath. You see, friends, each and every day in Dubai, it is an opportunity to preach about the Sabbath. Stand up for the Sabbath. Don't be ashamed to be a servant day Adventist in Dubai. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Sometimes keep the Sabbath. Sometimes we are in the church, but we are responding to our work emails. Sometimes we are in the church, but we are responding to the business WhatsApp groups. You are in the church physically, but mentally you are working. The Bible says, brothers and sisters, we need to keep the Sabbath. And I just want to talk about something. You see, friends, Sabbath is not about divine hour from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. Many of us, we have that mindset, we think that the Sabbath is a divine hour from, one, from, 10, from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. But the Bible says the Sabbath starts from Friday sunset until Saturday sunset. And there are some people that I think that a divine service is more holier than the AY. Divine service is more holier than, than, the, uh, than the Sabbath school. But friend, the Bible says that the holy hours are from Friday sunset to, uh, to Saturday sunset. And many of us, we tend to take this divine service holy when we're being asked to prepare something in the church. If it's a divine service, you give a hundred percent. But if it's AY, you don't give a you, you don't give a hundred percent. Whatever that you're going to participate from Friday evening, from the Vespers until Saturday uh, sunset, remember it's the holy hours. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. The Bible says, Moreover, 
I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctified them. You see, friend, uh, the Sabbath is like a marriage. In a marriage, you need time with one another. You need quality time. And when it comes to the Sabbath, the Bible says that I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I'm the Lord who sanctified them. How then do we keep the Sabbath? Is it okay to go to the gym on a Sabbath? Is it okay to go to watch a football match on a Sabbath? Is it okay to go for swimming on a Sabbath? Let me tell you what the Bible says here. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 58 verse 18, the Bible says that if you turn away your foot from my Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and you call it a Sabbath, a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, you shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Praise God. The Bible says, hey, the Sabbath, actually the Sabbath is not about you, but it's about him. Because the Bible says that uh, you shall not do your own ways, nor finding your own pleasures, nor speaking your own words. As a matter of fact, the Sabbath is not a day of networking, whereby we come to church, we network, we find some job opportunities. This is not a day about that. The Sabbath is a day of worship. We keep the Sabbath holy by worshiping the God that made the heavens and the earth. Man, I love, I love playing football. And we, as I was in the high school many years ago, I used to be in the football team. And it, it, it was a challenge because uh, the football training used to happen on a Sabbath. And have you ever noticed something? Most of the things that we love so much, they actually happen on a Sabbath. And God is like, hey, this is my day. You see, friend, the cost of following Jesus is not easy. Sometimes the Lord will put you on a situation where, but hey, they are offering you a good salary. And they're like, just come and send the contract on a Sabbath. It's just going to take five minutes. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Another question that I want to talk about here is that, can we cook on a Sabbath? Can you go to some nice restaurant on a Sabbath? Go with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 16, uh, yeah, verses 21 to 30. Exodus, chapters, yeah, Exodus chapter 16. It's a long verse, but it's interesting. From verses 21 to 30, this is what the Bible says. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. But when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice, they gathered twice as omen, two omens for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is going to be a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. Verse 24, so they saved until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stick or get mugged on it. It today, Moses said, because today is the Sabbath to the Lord, you find any of it on the ground today. Six days you have to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Lord, there will be no any on the ground. Verse 27, nevertheless, some of the people went out on a Sabbath to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will your people refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why the sixth day he gave you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day, and no one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. You see, friend, the same stubbornness that we found in, uh, in, in the book of Exodus chapter 16 is the same stubbornness that we find today. The Bible says that the Lord would provide a manna, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And my Bible says on Friday, the Lord will provide a manna, a double portion, which is good enough for Friday and the Sabbath. And the Lord constructed the people, do not go out, you're not going to find anything. And people, they were still stubborn. On a Sabbath day, they would go out and there was nothing. We still find the stubbornness today. We give so many excuses about the Sabbath. And friend, Jesus Christ is coming very soon. Jesus Christ is coming very soon. We need to do something about that. I believe that the best sermon that you can preach is about what has happened in your life. Now, many years ago, before my dad was baptized, 
We used to have like a tax shop, like, 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 like a grocery store. So it was always a challenge when it comes on the Sabbath. Because my mom would say that we need to close the shop because I need to go to church. And my dad would be like, no, but why can't you close the shop on a Saturday? This is when we can make a lot of money. Everybody is off. People want to buy some groceries. So don't do that. And my mom was like, listen, I'm going to church. If you want to open the store, go and work over there. So catch this. My dad used to go to the grocery shop on Saturday. And guess what? There was no any business on Saturday. And my mom goes on a Sunday. He, my mom would make a double profit, which is enough for Saturday and Sunday. And my dad is like, what's happening? Like, why is it you're making a lot of profits on a Sunday? And then my mom was like, because I'm following what the Bible says. And guess what? My dad was like, you know what? Forget about it. Every Saturday, we are crossing the grocery. They just open it on a Sunday. You see, friends, when we choose to stand up for Jesus, I know sometimes it's a hard decision to do. But when we choose to stand up for Jesus, the Lord is going to do something. If you are in church today, if you're sitting right here, I want to tell you that you're not making any loss but you're actually making a profit. I love the writings of Ellen White. Let me tell you what Ellen White says uh, about the Sabbath. If you go to the Testimonies of the Church, Volume 6, this is what Ellen White says. She says that, On Friday, let the preparation of the Sabbath be completed. See that all your clothing is in readiness and all that the cooking is done. Let the boots be blacked and the baths be taken. It is possible to do this. If you make it a rule, you can actually do it. The Sabbath is not to be given to the repairing of garments or to the cooking or of food or pleasure seeking or to any worldly employment. Before the setting of the sun, let the secular work be laid aside. Let the secular papers be put out of sight. Parents, parents. Explain your work and its purpose to your children. Let them share your preparation in keeping the Sabbath according to the commandments. In other words, we don't buy on the Sabbath. God is telling you, I'm giving you six days to prepare. What do you want to eat on the Sabbath? You cannot buy on the Sabbath. If you drive, the Lord is telling you, I'm giving you six days. Put a full fuel so that on Sabbath, you don't have to go and put a fuel. Because if you do that, the Bible says, no, within the elements, within thy gates, you're actually making somebody to work. Keeping the Sabbath. You see, friends, we don't cook on the Sabbath. You don't wake up on, you, you don't wake up on Saturday morning. You go on the wardrobe and then you start ironing. Friends, give me that old time religion. I want it. Give me that old time religion whereby when it was Friday, we gather in someone's home. We welcome the Sabbath. We pray together. If you're not involved in any of the Vespers, start a small group so that you can be able to welcome the Sabbath. As I live in that last days, I do want that, I do want that old time religion. You see, friends? Jesus Christ is coming very soon. Now the question comes, did Jesus Christ keep the Sabbath? Oh, yes, Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 23. The Bible says that, and it came to Nazareth, where he has been brought up, as it was his costume. He went on the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he, and he, and he handed the book to the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover of the sight of the blind, to set the liberty free and those that are oppressed. You see, friend, this is actually what the Sabbath is all about. The Sabbath is not about coming to church every day. We come to church, we hear a sermon after that, after the Sabbath, happy Sabbath, and then we just go home. I think at Seventh-day Adventist, the Sabbath, it is a day where we, whereby we come to church, we can hear the sermon, and then after the sermon, you can go out, hospital visitation. You can go out, prison visitation. You can go out. There was a brother that, that didn't come to church today. Let me call him. Hey, my brother, I didn't see you to church. I'm coming to you right now. This is what the Sabbath is here about. The Sabbath is not about divine service, but the Sabbath is about being a blessing to someone. 
Are we going to keep the Sabbath in heaven? Of course we're going to keep the Sabbath in heaven. This is what the Bible says in Isaiah 16, Isaiah 66, verse 23. And it shall come to pass that from new moon to another moon, from one Sabbath to another Sabbath, all shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. You see, friends, as we're living in the last days, the devil is going to do whatever it takes to destroy the Sabbath. And let's go back to our key text. Now, our key text, it says that <laughs> if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into the, into the hand. You see, friends, if there's something that is causing you to break the Sabbath, cut it off. Because Jesus Christ is coming very soon. Every Sabbath we sing that song. Signs of the times are fast fulfilling. Yes, Jesus shall return. Yes, we know that Jesus Christ shall return. But before Jesus Christ return, what is it that you need to cut off in your life? If you have some friends that are causing you not to keep the Sabbath, they'll call you, let's go out, cut them off. What profit is it that you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? If your job, you see, friends, if your job is causing you to, to, uh, to break the Sabbath, cut it off. It's not worth it. Because the Bible says that uh, let us focus our sins on the things that are not sin because the things that are sin, they're all temporary. I'm sorry, but sometimes if being in Dubai is causing you not to keep the Sabbath, you don't have time for devotion, you don't have time like, to, to, to pray in the morning, it's not worth it to be in Dubai because Jesus Christ is coming very soon. And the Bible says, if your right hand causes you to sin, just cut it off, friends. Jesus is coming again. And I don't know what I was struggling, but I struggle with this issue. May the Lord help us that so that we can be able to prepare for his second soon coming. If there's anything that is causing you to, uh, to, to break the Sabbath, let us cut it off. I've met so many people in this church that they have decided to follow Jesus. I've heard so many stories. People that say, listen, I'm going back home. I'm like, why are you not going back? Why are you going back home? He said, because of the Sabbath. I've been so working and I'm dying spiritually. I'd rather go home and do something. If there's some people that are doing well back home in my country and keeping the Sabbath, I can do it as well. The Hebrew says, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of a sin for a season. In other words, what profit is it that you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? Friend, Jesus Christ is coming again. I don't have time to talk about a marriage and tithe and offering, but let me just touch uh, about marriage and then tithe and offering, we can call it a sermon for another day. Now, let's talk about the marriage. The second thing that the devil had is about marriage. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the Bible says that, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, in our likeness that they may rule over the fish, the seas, the bears in the sky, over the livestock, all, all the world animals, over the creatures that are moving around. Now, it's interesting, if you go at the creation, and when God was doing the creation, God said, Let there be, there was. Let there be, there was. But when it comes to the human being, God he changes the language there. He said, let us make men in our own image. Now, catch this. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says that, Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden to tend it, to keep it, and to take care of it. As I was making this sermon, I just wanted to be on the fair ground. So what I'm going to do now I'm going to talk about the youth. I'm going to talk about the fathers. I'm going to talk about the mothers. And then I sit down. Now, to the youth. The Bible says that, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend it, to keep it, and to take care of it. Now, catch this. When God created Adam, the first thing that he gave him was the garden, which is on Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And the second thing that God gave him was uh, was the wife Eve where in Genesis chapter 2, 18. So follow me. God gave Adam the garden first before he gave him the wife. What was the purpose of the garden? The purpose of the garden was for him to take care of the garden. The purpose of the garden was for him to be a responsible man. As I was reading this, I came to think, see, the garden is a career. To my brothers, 
before we talk about marriage, the question that I have for you is that, do you have a garden? Because in the garden, in your career, you're going to learn how to say sorry to your colleagues. You're going to learn how to be a responsible man. You're going to learn how to manage your finances. And after you have your garden, and then you can talk about getting married. And my sisters, when a brother approaches you, I think it is okay to ask him, do you have a garden? And many of us, we might, yes, if a brother, when I take you on a debt, it is a responsibility. Listen, before we talk about that, do you have a garden? What do you do in a garden? Because in the Bible here, when God created Adam, the first thing that he gave him was the garden. And then now if you go in, uh, now if you go in uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, and then the Bible says that, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for men to be alone. I will make a helper comparable for him. The reason why we have so many divorces nowadays, because we just don't follow the Bible. We want to do the opposite way. Many of us, we want to experience John, uh, Genesis 2.18 before experience Genesis 2.15. Start in Genesis 2.15. Get into the garden. Make a career self. And then after that, come in experience. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. My brothers, let's have a garden before we get married. Many of the divorces that are happening today because we don't have any garden. And then we don't have time, but Genesis chapter 2, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 to 24. And then we're going to see what happened. Now, to the husband. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 33. The Bible says, Husband, love the wives as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for her. Can I just ask, I want someone who said, man, I'm a perfect man. Just stand up. But the Bible says, Husband, love the wives as Christ has loved the church. Do we have any perfect person here? We don't have. So you see, the Bible says that husband loves the wife as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself for her that they might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing water of the word, so that they may present to the church himself in a slander without a spot or string and such other thing. You see, friends, husband loves a wife as Christ loved the church. As I look in the church here, I see a bunch of sinners. I, I see liars. I see gossipers. Even myself, I'm a sinner. And God is saying, husband loves the wives as Christ has loved the church. It only takes, give me that old time religion, friends. It only takes through the prayers that we can be able to do that. And to the wives, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 24, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourself unto your husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wife be on their own husband in everything. Wives, submit yourself. And your husband. My sister, maybe you are married. I mean, maybe you are employed and your husband is not employed. The Bible says still you need to submit yourself unto your husband. My sister, maybe you earn more salary than your husband and your husband is, is earning less than you. But the Bible says, my sister, submit yourself unto your husband. Wives, submit yourself. There's a Bible story actually here. And do you still remember the story of Abigail and Nabal? Nabal was a fool, but Abigail was still submissive to that. That's what the Bible says. And nowadays you come like, what if, what if? But I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. I just don't have the time to talk about the tithes and offering, but we do know that tithes and offering, it is holy. May the Lord bless us. But in closing, there is hope. Because Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ that give me the strength. We can keep the Sabbath through Christ that give us the strength. We can have happy marriages through Christ that give us the strength. We can actually, uh, we can pay our tithe and offering through Christ that give us the strength. You see, friends, after this, con after this great controversy, one day we're going to see Jesus Christ. And we said, yes, indeed, we have fought a good fight. We have finished the rest. And now there's a crown that is waiting for us, not only us, but for all. We have longed for the second soon coming of Jesus. Paul says, I die daily. Each day I get an opportunity to listen to the word of God. When the truth of God has been presented to me, 
and recognize my failures. That's why Paul says, I die daily. Die daily, it means that I repent. And when you repent, you're not like a dog that vomits and goes back again. So brothers and sisters, we are living in the last days. May God help us to keep the Sabbath. May God help us to have holy marriages. And may the Lord help us to be faithful in our thoughts and offering. May the Lord bless us. Amen. Thank you.